factor. The conduction shape factor is given the symbol S in many textbooks. It's a new entity, S. Well, where does it come from? Well, remember our Fourier's law advertise Q is equal to K, A over L delta. Does that look reasonable for Fourier's law? Sure. What drives the flow is the temperature difference. What flows is the heat, heat transfer. It's, it's in watts, right? Just think about this. What are the SI units for delta T, degree C? What are the SI units for Q, watts? Okay, what was this K? It's a thermal conductivity. It's the property of the material. It changes if I'm conducting through wood or plastic or metal or gases. It, that's the property of the material. And then this term right here is an area to length ratio. Area to length. All it is is geometry. It's a geometrical parameter. And we do a little name calling. We call that S. And so what you'll have is you'll have KS delta T, conduction shape factor. And this is really useful because uh, it doesn't look all that insightful, but you can um, find that a region where it's all T1, maybe all this is temperature T1, and over here is temperature T2, everywhere along that edge is, is T2. And if somebody's solved this problem before, you can get the flow of heat from that line or in 2D representing constant temperature T1 to the line constant temperature T2 if somebody's given you that conduction shape factor. For a slab, it's almost too trivial. Here's all T1, here is all T2, and the conduction shape factor is the area divided by the separation distance L. That's just too trivial. But what they'll do is they'll tabulate this conduction shape factor. And here's a table in the textbook. They have a number of different cases. Here is one. What In each of these, you find that there's a line or a surface at T1 and a line or a surface at T2. So here we have an isothermal sphere buried in a semi-infinite material. So the semi-infinite material goes on and on. They cut it in half. That's why it's semi-infinite, not completely infinite, half of the world. And along that top edge is our constant temperature, T2. And our sphere buried at a depth Z, Z and diameter D of the sphere is at temperature T1. So what does the flow of heat look like? Well, it looks like this. It's flowing that way. And like that. And you say, well, I could solve this conduction problem if somebody gave me the shape factor. There it is, as long as you have some restrictions satisfied. Some graduate student or somebody a long time ago, probably 100 years ago, worked this out and tabulated it. Uh, here's one for a cylinder, isothermal cylinder buried in a semi infinite material. Here's one vertical cylinder, semi-infinite material. There's a bunch of these cases, and you can see more in other textbooks. Let's solve this problem. You have a 20 millimeter diameter disc, so we'll look at the side of the disc, and so this is the diameter right there. That's 20 millimeters. It dissipates 100 watts. When it's mounted on a large aluminum block, well, when you hear about a large aluminum block, guess what that block behaves as? Semi-infinite. It's a semi-infinite. It's mounted on a very large aluminum block. There's the thermal conductivity of that aluminum. And the large aluminum block is maintained at a temperature 27C. Well, that means that far away, it's 27C. Because this um, disk has heat being dissipated 100 watts. It's coming out of that disk, electronically being you know, generated. The contact resistance right between the bottom of the disk and the semi-infinite material, I just erased it, is given by RTC double prime is... 0 0.00005 meters squared Kelvin per watt. 
Are those the right units for our contact resistance used in this textbook? Is that the right notation for it? Is it reasonable? Yeah, it is. Okay. Between the device and the block. Assume all 100 watts is transferred by conduction to the block. So all of this heat is going off into the block. Well, what about the convection at the top? Maybe there's airflow. Neglect it. And then calculate what is that temperature of the block. So you want to find this temperature. So there's a couple temperatures that you introduced. You could introduce the temperature of the block or maybe just call that T1. You could represent the temperature right below the block in, uh, I'm sorry, right below the disk in the block, maybe call that T2. And then you could have the temperature far away, T3. We only know T3. Okay. So how do I calculate for T1 the temperature of that disk? Well, this looks like a conduction shape factor problem. We would go to the textbook and look for if somebody solves something similar to it. And so this is case 10 out of the textbook. It says a disk of diameter D and temperature T1 on a semi-infinite medium of thermal conductivity K and temperature T2 far away. And this, what is the shape factor? Two disk diameter. Um, it would be a little bit of work, but we could solve for it, but somebody already did solve for it, so let's just use that result. So we come back here and we have a thermal network. We're going to have to first pass that 100 watts from T1 to T2. What type of resistance is offered just to get it into the top of the aluminum block? Well, it has to go through that contact conductance, yeah, that contact resistance. And then it goes all the way to T3, which is 27 degrees C. So this one over here, that one's pretty easy. Remember, let's go back. We had Q is equal to K A over L delta T, or um, delta T divided by some thermal resistance. Um, and so what you have is you have the resistance is 1 over K S. Maybe I should have emphasized that this is Ks delta T. Hence, it's delta T over R. R is 1 over Ks. Instead of L over Ka, you have 1 over Ks. Okay. The other resistance is due to that uh, con contact. Okay. Well, what is that? It's our R double prime Tc divided by A. That's one of the reasons I would prefer this book of used 1 over HCA, and you'll see the H contact, the contact, conductance, H used in a lot of books. It makes more sense to me, but hey, this is the notation in the book, so we'll stay with it. Let's ask this question. Okay. <clears throat> if S is equal to A over L, what are the typical SI units for S? Meters, meters per second, watts. It's just meters. All right. What are the SI units then for 1 over KS? 1 over KS. That's right. It'll be uh, degree C per watt, isn't it? Yeah. All right. How about the R double prime TC? Well, remember here are the units right up here. So just you have the meter squared. Kelvin per watt, you divide by meter squared area, you get Kelvin or temperature difference per watt. It's Those units are consistent. Units will not prove that you have the right approach or the right answer, but sometimes they'll detect if you have a problem. True? So I think we had this correct. So what we do is we come in and we say, okay, well, the 100 watts is equal to what drives it it's going to be the difference between the higher temperature T1, which we're trying to calculate, and T3, sorry, T3 far away. And we divide by the sum of those resistances. 
that R double prime TC divided by area plus 1 over KS. So that's our resistance equivalent. Let me just kind of do it down here, scoot down just a little bit. And so it was 0 0.00005 meters squared. Let's put Kelvin per degree uh, C, oops, per watt. All right, and then our area is pi diameter squared. What was our diameter? 20 millimeters, 0 0.020 squared divided by 4. And then we have 1 over the thermal conductivity, 177 watts per meter degree C, or Kelvin, times the conduction shape factor, which was 2 times the diameter, 0 0.020 meter. When you calculate that resistance, it comes in at 0 0.3004 degrees C per watt. Hence, you can solve that T3, oops, T1 is equal to T3 plus Q times that resistance total or equivalent. And you come up with that T1 is 57 degrees C. So there's an application of using the conduction shape factor. Yes? Uh, because that's our uh, problem right here. It's kind of like this is all T1. Really, the focus is on the bottom of it. That's all T1. Um, and then this is all T2. Or when we put another contact in there, then this uh, becomes T2, that becomes T3, and the one above it is T1.